Uh, our next speakers are from uh, Peter Bees and Franz Lars and Peter Sales. Welcome you up, Franz. Franz, a moment to uh, do the technical things. Uh, I'm Peter Sales, the chairman of Peter Bees. Um, and so the plan that we'll talk this afternoon is just give a little bit of background on our company and then uh, Franz will bit more information on just what we've been technically uh, up to the last few years and what we plan to do next. So we can drive this thing for you. There we go. Um, the Better Bees company sort of uh, began actually in around about 2002 when uh, in the Targa and South we had quite a few uh, beekeepers got together as a uh, beekeepers discussion group and one of the things we worked on was uh, identifying the sort of strengths and weaknesses uh, in our business and one of the things that was uh, becoming more important was the lack of um, quality, uh, quality queens to breed from and you have to bear in mind that uh, around 2000 when Barrow arrived in the, uh, the North Island a lot of South Island beekeepers uh, got queens down from the North Island um, to, to requeen the colonies and of course once the control lines were in place uh, and no one wanted to bring Varroa down in any case. So um, that meant that there was a, a problem that's sort of emerging there with um, how to uh, get um, re to requeen the colonies. Um, partly, I guess, further south on the island, the opportunities for, for queen breeders were, with a shorter season weren't too good, and so there was uh, generally a shortage of queens. So, um, yeah, as a result, uh, we, we decided that what we really needed to do was um, probably set up a, a company that would produce these breed queens for us. And, um, and that decision was made in about uh, 2003 or 2004, we first set up. And um, we had a group of uh, people who committed then and uh, uh, provided the company with beehives and uh, with funds. And we uh, pulled Franz as our uh, first manager and, and only. <laughs> And, uh, and so um, we got underway. That's the original crew. You might recognise a few of them there. They're all a few years old, of course. But um, Murray Ballantyne is the guy sitting in the, in, the, in the hot seat in the middle there. Uh, Murray's not here today, but um, he's up in the North Island as beekeeper now. And uh, he was really probably a driving force behind, in the first instance, the discussion group. And also, uh, of course, for better bees, he was the original chairman. Uh, just before we get onto that pretty picture, um, the, at that time we had something like 14 or 15 shareholders, and um, uh, since then the company's about doubled. There's a lot of queen, uh, a lot of commercial bookkeepers in the North Island now, um, and it's doing their company as well. I put that slide up. It's um, you, the audience is old, and I probably to know Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, um, two very funny English comedians. One was tall, and one was short. Um, and in their case, of course, it was because of their genes. And I would love to say, as a chairman of Better Bees, that one of these has a Better Bees queen and the other one doesn't. But you wouldn't believe me anyway. Um, but uh, it's an example of, you know, staying in business and not really. And the question, of course, when you see a photograph like that is, well, why has one hype done so well and why has one not? And as you probably all know, you can get a dud, just one thing going wrong. Uh, but to get a hive that really does well, a lot of things have got to go right. So I sort of have a term I've sort of coined for that, I guess, is, um, is GLAM, the GLAM beehive. Um, you really need a combination of genetics, a bit of luck, and of course good management, and probably not necessarily in that order. And I guess, you know, you, when you have a good season, it's a case of all the ducks in a row, isn't it? And this, you know, then you hit the division one, whatever it might be. And um, genetics is a small part of this. I guess one of the reasons I want to sort of think about that is that um, you know we're in the business of trying to improve our genetics, but that alone it doesn't get you very far. Well, you know, it's all to do with your management and how well you make use of what luck is, comes along. In that case, um, a nice two queen hive did very well, and the one that went queenless and I couldn't really queen <laughs> in time didn't do any good at all. So in 2004, we uh, started our closed breeding program with those, that foundation stock we had from our, our own uh, shareholders. A pretty motley bunch of bees, actually, to begin with. 
I don't think they gave us their best or the second best, but um, we got cracking with what we had, and um, very quickly in the piece, um, and about that time, David Yonke, who many of you may know, he ran an Italian breeding program in the far north, but actually he really loved County Owens, and so we were lucky to um, be the recipients of some semen from his program, which was really beautiful Italian stock. And of course, at that time, he'd been dealing with Varroa for a little while as well, and had been selecting from hygienic behaviour and so on, so there was a little bit of tolerance perhaps built into that stock as well. Um, so in the intervening sort of eight years or so, we, we've, we've been basically selecting our, our hives on a, on a bunch of criteria that our own shareholders said, this is what really matters to us. So it's, it's the obvious ones, like honey production, which actually we measured by a weight gain, which correlates very nicely. Um, and of course, their, their general disease situation, how healthy they are, uh, how well they build up and so on. All the things that are important to beekeepers. The only kind of um, work we did during that period, which was probably uh, related to Varroa in a way, and it has turned out that in fact it has been, is the work we did on hygienic behaviour. And we've found that the hives we selected for high hygienic behaviour, when we tested those against Varroa in the North Island, that they were the ones that in fact did the best uh, against Ferrara. So, but Franz will talk a little bit more about that. That's uh, the Brady Art of Invermay, it's about 150 odd colonies there, which um, have all been AI'd and are about to be sent out to the evaluation site. So, we, we send these sites out into the um, Otago and Southland and a little, a little further afield. And at each site, we have uh, a variety of colonies that have been AI'd from various families, so we can compare them against one another in any particular environment. It's interesting that really the environment hasn't made a great deal of difference. So for example, in the cold central Otago winter, and then you might have a mild coastal site. The bees that tend to do well in one site tend to do well in another, which is a little bit counterintuitive. You might think that the bees are more sensitive to where they are, but um, the ranking tends out to be much the same. <coughs> Um, once we had established our, our, breeding, our breeding program and evaluation colonies, of course, the payback for the shareholders is they were getting um, AI queens every year. So each year the shareholders get three AI queens, which they then take back home and get ready yards and set to and raise their own queens. Uh, just the, the second point there is that, um, that when we did get these high hygienic bees, um, they were then sent to the North Island and, um, and trialled and, and Franz will give you a bit of a talk on that one. <coughs> so we'll let him do that. Right, um, the problem we had of course with the Better Bees program was we had um, no Varroa. So how do we select for Varroa tolerance when you don't have Varroa? So the option we had was to send some uh, colonies uh, to the North Island. These were selected from the daughters of lions which expressed extremely high hygienic behaviour. Basically they would remove all um, <coughs> larvae out of a freeze killed brood when you liquid nitrogen and within 24 hours they had to basically remove every single piece of brood out of that colony. Um, <coughs> so what we did was um, we tested these things in the autumn. Um, this graph is actually relatively si similar to what uh, we looked at um, the VSH levels um, compared with the cell infection rates. This was done, this is a pilot study, so I don't take too much into it. But, um, and this was also taking the last frame of brood in the autumn where there's all the reproductive mites had to be in that one particular frame. So what we did find was that the, the bees expressing um, the highest SMR level, these bees are relatively uh, naive to Varroa. They fit they had some residual stuff from David Yonke's work done in, uh, early, in the early parts of 2000 to 2003. Um, but the bees expressing around that 40, 45% Varroa, uh, sorry, SMR or BSH now, had around about a 10% cell infection rate. And the bees which expressed low, uh, low BSH levels had relatively high infection rates. So it gave us some um, bit of confidence that selection for hygienic behaviour was was not the be all and end all, but it was a, a useful method in the interim to uh, to try and increase the probabilities that our bees are slightly more tolerant to uh, to varroa mite. Okay, some of the work we've been doing um, with the Better Bees program was uh, 
In 2009 to 2011, we assisted uh, with the PhD students' work on gene plasticity in, uh, in, um, in bees, especially a lot of work related to um, genes uh, switching on and off in, in terms of converting a uh, queen into a worker in terms of uh, early embryogenesis. So that was a quite interesting study. Um, 2011, we started getting concerned with inbreeding issues um, and one of our measures of um, for dealing with brood viability was the sustained 100 cell rhombus test. But what we found was that, <coughs> because we ranked range, a whole range of um, environmental conditions, we were finding that there was statistical evidence to show that the environment affected brood viability uh, result. Not the actual brood viability and the real brood viability, but the expression of brood viability. And also, when you look at varroa infected hives, the un uh, removal of the uh, varroa also affects your, your ability to determine what's what you're looking at is, is real. Um, so we decided we're going to look at sex allele testing. I mean, there's a wee bit of work being done overseas on it, and we decided that it would be uh, prudent to actually see what uh, number of sex alleles we had in our, uh, our population. Um, I predicted based on the mathematical probability that we'd have around 16 to 18 sex alleles in the, in the population. And when we actually did it, we actually ended up with 16. So it was pretty well on the mark. So I was quite pleased with that. Um, it's a very valuable tool to, um, you know, to mitigate inbreeding problems. We all know that uh, bees are very susceptible to inbreeding, far more than um, mammals. So we, and we also know that if you inbreed or close a population to, um, and have insufficient bees, that the, the eventually the colony, the whole population crashes and burns. So we're uh, quite mindful of that. <coughs> and we did a sexual status of better bees, and also I think we asked Michelle and that to supply some bees from the uh, Mercury Island population, which we did for them. And um, I think we can say slightly that what was interesting is that about half the, the sex alleles that the Mercury Island bees population had was, was different to our, to our pool. So um, that was reasonably uh, <coughs> hopeful that we could get, you know, there's a bit of new genetics uh, coming into the system. Um, Currently, uh, Peter Dead, one of the co-authors of the paper, has published it, has been about the process of publishing uh, the work we did with the Better Bees component in an apidology, so that should be coming out sometime this year. Um, <clears throat> 2012 in January, we um, got some semen from the Mercury Island Bee Project, and we hybridised that with um, a line of, uh, our, again, our high, most highly hygienic lines. We currently got about 100 um, colonies that are going to be tested in the spring. Okay, this is basically our, our current plan for the um, for the uh, Mercury Island, well, say, well, BSH work we're dealing with. Is we've now established a population with 100 colonies there in Central Otago. Um, we're going to uh, do our initial assessments. We're using BSH, hygienic behaviour, and other general uh, production characteristics, um, <clears throat> and just to see what um, result of the hybridisation has. Um, <coughs> And um, we use, um, use the best colonies and we use instrumental insemination. We use multiple drone lines rather than single drone sources or single drone lines because I think we believe that uh, multiple matings are quite important to, in maintaining a good quality queen. Um, our single drone insemination, which we normally do, run, lasts about four months. So, you know, four months is not a particularly long time for a, a queen to live. Um, whereas the uh, well AI queen will last you know, sort of quite regularly three to five years, and we've had one that lasted six years. She was a bit dottery, I think she had six walking sticks, but um, she was certainly alive. <coughs> um, so, what we're also doing is uh, normally our breeding values are weighted for honey production, and this particular line will be weighting the um, <coughs> more for variety tolerance rather than production characteristics, because this is separate from our main breeding line we won't interfere with the qualities in our current breeding program. Because when you hybridise uh, closed lines, hybrid vigour can be somewhat of an issue. Not only do you get, um, <coughs> you can get unpredictable results with bees. So we know when Sue Kobe crossed her New World Carniola line with, the, with a line of the um, Kukine um, Carniola line, they ended up, a couple of years, they ended up with some interesting surprises, plus a, a few new set of viruses they didn't have. <coughs> Okay, we've got to re-establish the test population again. That's always the mission, because we, we take the best, uh, best breeders and then expand them out again. 
Uh, with our main line, we, we expand from you know, over, well over 100 breeders. Evaluation column is down to 25 lines. And each queen is inseminated with 25 different drone sources. Probably something like 2,500 individual drones, semen and sperm will be actually in the spermatheca, so they are exposed to quite a, a wide genetic uh, pool. Okay, now year two, obviously we're going to just repeat the process. And depending on what we find, we may introduce, have a controlled introduction of the superior stocks into our better bees line. It's always a bit of a risk, so what we tend to do there is that we will take uh, semen from the main pool across with the daughters of the uh, VSH program and then evaluate them against the main breeding population to see if there's any uns uh, untoward surprises. If there's, any, if there's nothing problematic, then we can introduce it with, with lower risk. Um, we're also doing a lot more uh, sex allele determination um, to make sure we've got sufficient uh, sex allele in the pool. Generally, once you get below about eight or nine, then uh, brood viability problems become uh, quite problematic. And we believe even with 16 or 17 sex alleles in a pool, in a gene line, or in a population that's getting marginal, anything over 20 is it's actually quite satisfactory. Okay, the other one we're looking at is, we now know that viruses are becoming quite an issue and uh, with, uh, with, as part of the Varroa complex. And what we're looking at is that we now know that uh, bees do have a relatively uh, weak immune system. They have uh, the number of the genes available for, uh, for maintaining uh, immune responses are, are, are less than compared with, say, a mammal. And so we know that bees use uh, behaviour to clean up uh, a lot of their problems, like hygienic behaviour removing infected larvae, removing, like with varroa, they can detect the varroa, they actually remove the pathogen from the, um, from the cell. And that's uh, quite an interesting um, evolution and it also becomes part of the weakness. <coughs> so what we're looking at is uh, looking at the virus titer of the uh, bees as part of the selection process and see if that correlates with the, uh, any other responses, whether the variety levels are high, the less PMS, whatever. Because the, if you keep the virus levels low, uh, then obviously other um, you know, negative issues in the hive um, are, are lessened. We're not too sure what we're going to find here. But what we do know that like honey production is clearly uh, a, a, the sum of probably eight or ten different factors that go on in the hive. Um, and sometimes certainly for honey production you're actually for selecting something which is uh, completely different. So one thing we do know that in our pool that hygienic behaviour is strongly correlated with uh, the breeding value for hygienic behaviour very strongly correlated with uh, honey production values. So breeding value of one the highest breeding value for honey production in our colony will also mean the highest hygienic behaviour. So, we, but whether you select for one or the other, you've got to be careful. You may be throwing the baby out the bathwater. So, we've got to be a bit careful there. Okay, then again, we um, will just continue with further breeding work. Um, it's just a sort of routine uh, thing every year. Start with the test population, move down to the test, and then expand them out again. Okay, year three. We'll just continue again as usual, um, and uh, we'll really see pro uh, progress, and if there's anything we need to change, we'll, we'll make some changes. And at that stage, we've probably got enough information to start putting some more of the uh, VSA genetics into our standard uh, pool. Okay. Then, then we don't have bees that are economic with our shareholders to go out and do the business, whether it's producing honey or, or uh, doing pollination work. Um, part, of the, part of the agreement we have with Plant and Food, the NBA, is that the um, results of the, any of the SVSH uh, work we're doing, that if anyone in industry uh, needs to take advantage of that, that, uh, that work we're doing, that those queens, those queens or semen will be available. I think just 
digress a little bit here. Uh, personally, we are very pleased in the company that someone else is doing this work as well. Um, we're a very small country with very few breeding programs. The more, the better. Um, we're just running to what Philip was saying before about the, the, the lack of the gene pool. I think it would be great to see quite a number of um, people take on this kind of work. We're going to need one another. We're going to need to collaborate with each other um, to swap material with one another, to prevent inbreeding, that type of thing. And I think that's the way, for, way forward for us. And I guess the final point that's already been made to by other speakers today, and this is a very slow process. We've spent you know, eight or 10 years now in better bees working on other aspects of a nice bee. And we are seeing increases in those those traits that we want to see, but it is a very slow effect. You, you know, you can get some big jumps once in a while, but um, at the end of the day, uh, as I'm often reminded uh, by my spouse, you can't make rats out of mice. And so we're never going to get a rat out of this. We're always going to get, you know, a fatter or skinnier or longer or a quicker mouse. And um, if we can get a bee that in the end has got some traits that allow us to carry on making good honey uh, or doing other beekeeping business we do, but at the same time slowly lift the spear states trait, um, then that's going to help us with, uh, to combat varroa. I guess I kind of feel like the a honey bee collapses when there's a whole bunch of things adding up to go wrong. But I think the solution is the other way around. A whole lot of good things adding up to get it right again. And it might be a combination of the VSH trait, a mesh bottom board, oxalic acid, the, the when you split and when you treat, all those things. But it's, it's not going to be a big hit. It's going to be, an, I think, the, the long term solution for us is going to be a lot of small things that add up to a good result. Cheers. We uh, just uh, forgot to mention that um, part of the uh, collaboration with the University of Otago is that. Um, we are looking also at genetic markers um, in our bees. We're currently, um, some work's been undertaken where we're co correlating hygienic behaviour with known genetic markers. So uh, we're just currently waiting for those results. So um, we're actually using our old redundant breeder queens. Um, we normally trade them in after a year. And um, so that's uh, their surplus for, uh, for research work. So over the last few years, they've been collecting uh, not only uh, work for their own studies on ovarian development, but uh, also been taking genes and, and looking at genetic markers. And hopefully in the next few months, the laboratory doing it on their behalf will come up with some interesting results. Um, a lot of talk about things going wrong, so I thought I might have a couple of nice sites that we'll get. Can get two hives on a pallet the same size. Just waiting for the rain to stop. And sometimes all the ducks line up and the whole yard does well. So. <laughs> Can you hear? We did run a program for a while with Carney Owens and Italians because we wanted to do the comparison. But the difficulty, as you soon learn, that beekeeping's hard enough, breeding's even harder, and it's just a matter of resources. We didn't really have the resources to do justice with the Carney Owens program. And uh, so, in fact, we've made a, a, Michelle, you mentioned before, we do Carney Owens. In fact, we've just made a decision not to do the Carney Owens anymore. So we can really concentrate on, the, on our Italian line and also now, of course, on working on the VSH line. And besides, the someone already doing a great job of Carney Islands in the far north. It's a bit ironic, actually, that he's up there and we're down here. The, the breed should probably be the other way around, but there you go. seeing what you want to see yeah. and um, so we actually put ourselves under the microscope a few years ago we did a double blind experiment for two years with our own queens and queens from three other queen breeders none of the people raising those queens knew what they were raising them for none of the people running the apiaries knew which queens were which and so we, we really we really wanted to be sure we were seeing you know were we seeing something different or were we not and the reality was that across all of those traits we measure, uh, on average our bees were 
a, a shade better. And one or two trades statistically quite significantly better. So that made us feel a lot, a lot heavier. Um, a very interesting thing came out of that study, actually. The statistician says, well, you know, this is what's happened. But you realize that the, the best correlation he found was, in fact, that the hives that had the highest honey scores were also the quietest, which could have surprised a lot of us. But there you go. You couldn't argue with the facts. So, yeah, so we've done the work. Um, I won't say we'll always be able to keep ahead of the head of the... You get the feeling, actually, after a while, that the best you're going to do is just do a good job every year. We're not going to get better and better bees every year. It's, it's just, I don't think we can do that. But if we manage to build up the traits we need, and as, as people's needs change as well. Was this last season's Yeah, that was a lucky one. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't it? I'm, I'm glad it happened just before I retire. Oh, I have to say too that I, and that's actually the last pre varroa honey crop too because that area has almost certainly got light snaps. That might change the picture next year. Sorry? Have you actually got varroa in your Yes, well we went to great lengths for a while to make sure we didn't spread it anywhere because varroa was in central Otago but not in Invermay, our main, our main site. Um, but, so we've had bees in central Otago that we didn't bring back because we knew they had varroa. Um, but recently mites have been found right through the Dunedin area so it's pretty well filled in the gaps. My question really, the bulk of your breeding doing this without variety. So yes. how can you read for these traits without variety? Uh, one of the, as I said, around about when we started the company, we, we not only did we need to do the work down there because of growers in the North Island, but it also, the other side of that story was we also had a window of opportunity to do some measuring of beehives without variety. Because when variety comes along and you start treating, there's a real danger, and we're in this situation now, that the randomness of invasion, for example, will give unreliable data in the beehives. So we're in a situation where, on the one hand, we need to control varroa in order to be able to compare some traits in hives, but at the same time, we need to have a challenge with varroa in order, in order to, see, to see how well they, they perform against it. And as Franz pointed out before, it turns out that by testing for hygienic behavior, um, there has been a correlation with um, the VSH. <laughs> no, says Michelle. <laughs> well, I, I wonder actually, you see, I'd love to know more about this, but one of the things about hygienic behaviour, of course, is an uncapping behaviour. And of course, in VSH, we have uncapping behaviour. So I'd love to, at some point when we have the panel to discuss that one further.